Good afternoon, dear friends. This is History Lessons with Tamara Eidelman. Today we're going to talk about Grishka Rasputin, Grigory Efimovich Rasputin, the famous, terrible, horrible Rasputin. Thank you to our patrons on Patreon. Thank you to our sponsors on YouTube for supporting us, for keeping us going. And that's why we can film our lectures. And if anyone else wants to support us, that would be just great. What was it like to read books, say, in the Middle Ages? A scholar would come into his study and his office would be littered with huge volumes. Each volume is worth its weight in gold. The pages are made of parchment and a lot of calves were used for one book. The binding is powerful, heavy. So our scientist opens such a volume and delves into reading. If he needs to check something in another book, he slams it shut. You can't just grab the next one. You have to put the first book aside, reach for the second, and maybe even go to the other end of the table, open it there. It's not easy to lift a book. So say an hour passes. The scientist was busy during the day, lecturing at the university, and turned to books in the evening. So he reads by candlelight, which is not easy, because his eyes are already ruined by his constant scholarly pursuits. Glasses haven't been invented yet. The flame fluctuates. One can only marvel at the courage of medieval scholars who read and wrote so much. We have a much easier life now. Books are easier to carry. You can read with an electric lamp. Glasses are available at any optical shop. But I personally have a different problem. I want to read all the books in the world. I know that this, alas, is impossible. But I do everything in my power to get closer to this ideal. I read all the time, and therein lies the problem. I love reading paper books, but lugging a book around is hard. Great, I take an electronic one on the road. But what do you do when you're walking down the street, riding in a car or on an escalator in the subway? I can't be idle. I can't not read. And now I have a faithful and very favorite friend, Storytel Service, which I use every day. I pay a subscription fee of 549 rubles, and I always have a huge library on my phone. And e-books and audio and podcasts and lectures, there is nothing here. You open the app and you are immediately offered a selection of fiction books, non-fiction. There is a convenient search system. You can search by title, by author, even by reader. There are books and modern authors and classics in Russian, and what I especially like, a lot of audiobooks in English. There's a bookshelf where you can put the book you haven't read yet. If you want to listen to another one now, much more comfortable than in the study of a medieval scholar. By the way, I'm partnering with Storytel too. I write for their blog, and I've audio recorded my literary history article. They also have a selection of my favorite books. Anyway, thanks to Storytel, I now listen to books all the time, morning and evening, at lunch and outside. Every lecture I give requires a lot of reading, so there's no time to waste. And in the evening I go to bed and listen to something not work-related. Right now it's the Lord of the Rings. Tolkien is here almost all in English. All in all, Storytel is a great service. If you're not already subscribed to it, sign up at my link and get 30 days free access. Thanks, Storytel, for the fact that I can now read all day long in a row. And thank you for supporting History Lessons with Tamara Eidelman. My first association, shall we say, with Rasputin coming from my high school years, like probably a lot of people of my generation, is of course the Boney M song, which seemed like an incredible revelation in the 70s. And so I remember such a thing very well. My parents were friends with a wonderful Anglo-Bulgarian family, the Tempests, who lived in Moscow. Their son, Richard Tempest, who today is a famous philologist, slavist American, he was just a young man who went to school in Moscow, so he spoke Russian very well, of course, and then he went to Oxford. Here, at one point, they were visiting us. He was telling us how he had been to a Boney M concert. Everyone listened, everyone from small to large listened with shock. This was before Boney M came to Russia. Then I said to him, Richard, can you help me translate the lyrics of the song about Rasputin? Don't 
well, it's a hilarious video where the lead singer is a black man dancing as Rasputin. Of course, none of us have seen it yet, but I've written down the lyrics and I'm translating them. Some things are clear. Ra, Ra, Rasputin, lover of the Russian queen. Clear, lover of the Russian queen, the basic myth about Rasputin. Ra, Ra, Rasputin, Russia's greatest love machine. So the greatest, well, sex machine, I guess, Russia's love machine. What does it mean, I say, there was a cat that really was gone. And Richard, who knew Russian slang perfectly well and knows it, obviously says, well, it means he was a cool dude. And so funnily enough, all these ridiculous stereotypes from the Boney M song, they actually still exist today. If you type the word Rasputin on the internet, on the one hand, you'll get an incredible amount of vulgarity. All this speculation, all these sexual myths that were there then, that are reproduced over and over again today. On the other hand, historians who are trying to do something more serious, they may not say that Rasputin was a cool dude, but anyway. They're trying to explain that he wasn't this horrible guy. He wasn't this holy devil as his buddy first wrote him. And then his terrible enemy, the monk Iliodorus, who we'll talk about later today. Anyway, I have no doubt today that Rasputin was very much demonized. I will not discuss whether he was a saint. It is not in my competence at all. And I will not say that he was beautiful, marvelous, wonderful, but the fact that his vileness, his vileness, his vileness, his viciousness is grossly exaggerated. I have no doubt about that. Now, of course, historians are figuring out and will continue to do so what the level of this exaggeration is. The fact that he was really promiscuous, really was a bore, this is also in general clear. The question is, what are the proportions? What is the combination of his boorishness, his rudeness, his promiscuity, and the rumors and the propaganda? That's a very interesting question. And I think that today it should be very interesting for historians to study Rasputin, to break through stereotypes, fairy tales, legends, propaganda, to compare different stories. This, in general, is the craft of the historian. It should be incredibly interesting. What can we understand today? Grigory Efimovich Rasputin, the son of a Siberian coachman, was born in the village of Pokrovskoye in Tobolsk province. Obviously in 1869, although even here already begin different discrepancies, and further grew up in this village. And here we enter such an interesting slippery ground of all sorts of stories. For example, he told his daughters, and then his daughter Matrona recorded all this in her memoirs about her father, written of course with love for her father, that he already had some strange cases of clairvoyance as a child. So basically he was obviously creating an image of himself as a man destined for something high almost from a young age. Although he did not deny that he was a sinner at first, but that is another matter. At the same time, various stories of his fellow villagers are recorded that Grishka was a dirty, vile drunkard, a thief. That they beat him many times for his rudeness, for his drunkenness, that he was a horse thief. During Rasputin's lifetime, there was still talk of his horse stealing. It's something he was incredibly angry about, I must say. Somehow he found it very offensive. At the same time, all these stories from his fellow villagers, some of them were written down, say, after the revolution, when, of course, it was customary to curse Rasputin. And they could say what they wanted to say. At the same time, of course, he was envied. Even during his lifetime in the village, there were different attitudes towards him. That's why it's not quite clear. Anyway, there's a village boy growing up who probably has this rather violent behavior. 
gets married, has his first child who dies. And then around 1892, so it turns out he was in his early 20s. Somewhere between 21 and 23, he goes through some kind of breakthrough. He goes on a pilgrimage to a monastery and comes back a completely different person. What happened? There are a million versions. We can choose the one we all like. Say Rasputin's father, who was very skeptical of his future career, his behavior, said that Grishka began to go on pilgrimages because he didn't want to work as a peasant. So he was always leaving for half a year, a year, several years. So it's all from laziness. There was another version that he was so impressed by the death of his son that he tried to understand, to comprehend, and went to the monks to look for God, roughly speaking. There was a version that he met some monk, some pilgrim, also met somewhere, talked, also a typical situation in many legends, that a man is a sinner at first, then he talks to someone, has a shock and is reborn. Well, by the way, quite a possible variant in real life. There was a variant which apparently mostly his fellow villagers shared, that he was stealing something. Some Poles got a stake on the head for his theft and then he was reborn. Well, as you can see, there are variations from his most insulting to the most inspired, there are variations. But the thing to say is that all these subsequent searches of Rasputin and then for several years, well, actually 10, he will leave the village, come, go on pilgrimages. Then come back, live at home for a while, he will have more children. Then he would leave again, go on pilgrimage as far as Jerusalem. They describe how strange he came back, his incomprehensible, incoherent speech, how he sang prayers. By the way, even before he was accepted in St. Petersburg, he was suspected of sectarianism, there were some denunciations against him. They came to him and tried to find out if he had some special prayer room. And he did dig a kind of a pit where you could pray. He'd created a house church. He was suspected of being involved with a sect of whips that had these ecstatic celebrations, strange rituals where they danced and twirled. They were said to have some kind of weird group sex. And on the other hand, it was said that they abstained from all sexual relations. Anyway, there was something wrong with his religiosity. It was unorthodox, unusual. And this caused surprise and sometimes even fear among his fellow villagers. It displeased his superiors. Maybe that's why he left and came, by the way. And here, such an interesting thing, how much depends on our point of view? on how we look at it in general. When we talk about Rasputin, all these stories about his youth, they immediately create the image of such a strange, wild, completely indomitable man who doesn't know what he's doing. They keep popping up, going from book to book, incoherent speech, wild prayers, some incomprehensible singing. All in all, some kind of strange savage. On the other hand, if we think about it, the end of the 19th century, the second half, the beginning of the 20th century, it's a time of enormous powerful religious exploration. In the most different strata of society, and not only Russian, this is the time of the emergence of many esoteric teachings. Well, you've probably all heard of Helena Blavatsky with her quest for some great spiritual wisdom. There's a very widespread belief that she was just some kind of a fraud, a crook. On the other hand, we know some very respectable intellectuals. Well, there's Gustav Mehring, for example, a fine writer, who was very interested in esotericism, soul transmigration, the occult, and everything was reflected in his wonderful novel, The Golem. In our lecture on the history of schools, we talked about the famous Dr. Steiner, 
whose philosophy is the origin of the beautiful Waldorf schools. Steiner was also an esotericist, also looking for new ways, saying that man has an etheric body, an astral body. Well, Rasputin did not know such words, etheric and astral body. And these people, Meyerink, Steiner, even Blavatsky, they are such some intellectuals in their search. Well, in general, Rasputin is also searching for something on his own level. Conan Doyle, who we don't really associate with it, is associated with this kind of super rational Sherlock Holmes. But Conan Doyle himself was actually incredibly interested in the occult. Spiritualism believed in communicating with spirits. When Conan Doyle died, of all the members of his family, only his eldest daughter wore mourning clothes and the others refused to do so because they were convinced that their father was still alive, that they could communicate with him. And all this does not cause us any terrible indignation, surprise maybe. As for Russia then, of course, these unorthodox searches, they were obviously reinforced by the rejection of the official church, which in general, of course, after Peter turned into a state body. Indeed, the church was subordinated to the synod, a state body, headed by a secular man, a layman, always the chief procurator of the synod. The church carried out all the commands of the authorities. And this also caused reactions at various levels. Leo Tolstoy, with his rejection of this whole church apparatus and formal religiosity, what would lead to him writing The Kingdom of God is Within You and writing the novel Resurrection and being excommunicated? That's a very interesting part of Russian intellectual and cultural life. Or the search for people like Mereshkovsky and Gippius or the religious revival, all the religious philosophers of the early 20th century. They're all quite different from the creepy Grishka Rasputin. And on the other hand, there are many sects. Rasputin, first of all, is associated with the whips, with their mad races. And these sects do not seem to be some kind of horrifying. This is also an interesting phenomenon in popular religiosity. I love Andre White's novel, The Silver Dove where he has a sect of white doves. Well, modeled on the whips, of course. White is a man completely detached from practical life. But in history, he had a knack to get at some of the deepest things. You can see this in his novel, Petersburg. And here too, in The Silver Dove, he found some incredibly important things, incredibly important things for the whole of Russian life. If you look at this background, this strange, dirty snot, as his fellow villagers used to say, Grishka Rasputin, it becomes clear that he is on his own. Really wild, poorly thought out, poorly organized, maybe. On some strange, spontaneous level, he is also looking for some fresh, for some fresh, closer and clearer religious sensations although he does not break with the official church. He is suspected of sectarianism, but he considers himself, as it were, quite an orthodox Christian. Another thing is that at some point he begins to call himself, and others begin to recognize him as an elder, as a spiritual teacher. And eldership is also a very interesting phenomenon. First of all, it spread in the second half of the 19th century. Here we could talk for a long time about the Optina Desert, about the elders with whom Tolstoy and Dostoevsky talked, about the elder Zosima in the Brothers Karamazov. But again, Rasputin has nothing to do with it. He's vile, vile, filthy. He steams with ants in a bathhouse, and it's unclear what he does with them. Now we'll talk more about all the sexy talk. The whips are also accused that they have some kind of swamp sin going on there. 
And in principle, again, sexual search is also very characteristic of the turn of 99th and 19th centuries. When, on the one hand, there was fear of sex, attempts to deny it altogether. And on the other hand, on the contrary, experiments at all levels, from intellectuals to popular movements. Well, again, going back to deep, deep antiquity, attempts in particular through sexual ecstasy, as well as through wild dances, through strange music to have a mystical experience, to feel unity with God. And Rasputin, of course, to some extent, to all this, has something to do. But in what way? This, of course, will be long to find out. At the same time, we must say such a thing. That, again, the idea of Grishka Rasputin as just some kind of sexual maniac manipulator is very simplistic. He was a very interesting man with his own so extraordinary, let's say, worldview. He told me about his wanderings in his youth. I walked along the shores, found solace in nature, and often thought about the Savior as he who walked along the shores. He, let's say they're called to live according to the truth. He had a very interesting speech, by the way. They always cite these illiterate, strange little notes that Rasputin wrote to the Tsar with mistakes. Indeed, that's true. And at the same time, there are many memories of how he spoke interestingly. How people listened to his stories. By the way, he made a very strong impression on the Tsar's children, who just listened to him and he told them how he traveled. He talked about nature in a very interesting way. All sorts of people who liked him or did not like him said that here he began to talk and he was literally listened to. We have Rasputin, the embodiment of dark forces. He was strangely enough quite, well, the word liberal here, of course, does not apply, but quite interesting views. For example, he used to say 300 faiths exist, 300 truths. That is, people can believe in different ways. And for him, it seemed normal. But say about the leaders of the Black Hundred Union of the Russian people, Rasputin, who was such in our view, would have to fraternize with them at all. And he really, he communicated with them and they tried to somehow manipulate him, which they did not succeed. And he said about them, I don't like them. They do bad things. The bad is blood. He did not like the aggressiveness of the union of the Russian people. Another also interesting story. He was constantly besieged by various crazy petitioners. Someone asked something for themselves and someone for humanity, for Russia. A certain lady asked him, Starcha, help me remove the Yiddish from Russia. Anti-Semites, of course. He surrounded him with terrible force. On what Rasputin answered her, You what? They are people like us? At the fact that he is surrounded by people with incredible, such a beastly anti-Semitism. But he says that Jews are people like us. And that's an unexpected turn of events. Or suddenly, already being close to the Tsar, he says, You have to think about the man. You know, he's all the strength. The peasant is grateful. He is memorable. We need goodness and we have scandals. We need sincere servants, but we have only officials. Not such people will save, but the righteous will save. One can agree or disagree with this statement, but it is clear that similar phrases could sound from the mouths of many famous writers, Slavic and Slavic writers, of many famous writers, Slavophiles, and so on and so forth. And this is what this very promiscuous Grishka Rasputin says. He, of course, emphasized his masculinity. He even sometimes ostentatiously amplified it. There's a wonderful story about how one of the policemen who were assigned to Rasputin guarded him for a while when he began to speak strangely in the vernacular, he told him, well, let's keep it simple. The sacred is not necessary. It is very interesting that the sacred is something that comes from the people, from the people's element. And he, of course, there, let's say, defiantly ate with his hands often, although maybe he was really used to it. At the same time, let's say, he didn't eat sweets, he didn't eat much at all. 
so he tried to abstain. He didn't like people smoking in front of him. How this fits in with his orgies and binge eating is an interesting question. On the one hand, it might actually fit. I mean, on the one hand, he's trying to live this ascetic life. And then at some point, well, maybe he just loses it. Or on the contrary, he consciously goes on a binge. There can be a lot of different interpretations here. Just like all these incredible stories about his sexual exploits, about his sexual prowess, some kind of awesome sexual power, uh, they seem to be very overblown. In fact, there's a theory that he was impotent. There's a theory that he was homosexual and that he wasn't really interested in women at all. There is a version that he tried to overcome his sexual impulses, but he failed. There is another version that he was, on the contrary, experimenting in this way. Well, as he himself explained that he goes to prostitutes, and I think the prostitutes even confirmed it, and just talking to them to convert them, and on the other hand, to test himself to see if he can abstain. And it's a very interesting thing too. And there is a completely unbelievable and maybe even offensive association because we know a very different person who also in the 20th century experimented incredibly with sex, tried to give up sex. And in order to test how deeply that denial lived in him, he experimented and went to bed next to, with the nakedness of his students, young, beautiful women. And this is none other than Mahatma Gandhi. It would seem so. But who knows if this is the story that Rasputin was actually tried to experiment like this. And if they're true, then he too finds himself in an entirely unexpected line of those who were trying to achieve some kind of perfection and purity. We do not associate this with Grishka Rasputin, but however, at least it gives an opportunity for some reflection. Another amazing thing, again, we perceive Rasputin as a protege of dark black hundreds reactionary forces. We'll talk more about where that came from. But we know, for example, that he was on quite friendly terms with Count Witte, who was by and large a fairly liberal man. We know that Rasputin, say, respected Witte's opinion and met with him, which is somehow unexpected. But Rasputin, of course, met different people, because at some point he became a very important political force. That probably doesn't tell you anything yet. But here's another thing. The man I've already mentioned, this terrifying Sergei Trufanov, who would later become the monk Iliodorus, is, of course, an absolutely insane man with such wild ideas who was in league with the darkest and most reactionary forces. And in the end, he would go abroad and write a book exposing Rasputin, from which, in fact, everyone draws mostly horrible stories about him. So, in particular, one of the manifestations of this nice monk was that, well, even before the church began to persecute him, he was always calling anathema on Tolstoy in his parish, you know. When Tolstoy died, Iliodorus put up a portrait of him and encouraged his townspeople to spit on him. And he literally threw telegrams at the Tsar, urging him to curse Tolstoy more and more. And incredibly completely boorish like that. And Rasputin writes to him, the telegrams are a bit harsh, I'm lost in the idea, meaning Tolstoy. It's the bishop's fault, they didn't caress you enough. And you too are scolded by your own brothers. Sort it out. That is, even here he is not on extreme positions. Of course, with all these stories that I just quoted, it will take a long time for historians to sort out, to see where things are exaggerated, where it's invented. And there are plenty of invented stories, of course. But in any case, it all shows that Grigory Rasputin was not so simple and primitive as we think. What happens next? And then, after these years of wandering, pilgrimages, some kind of search incomprehensible, Rasputin already acquires a certain name. He is already considered an elder. 
he has already listened to. And then he, having secured letters of recommendation from various church figures, he is in St. Petersburg, where he is well received by the church hierarchs. Here he begins to be patronized by Theophan, first as an archimandrite, then as a bishop. Bishop Theophan at one time was even the confessor of the royal family, not for long though, but he was close enough for a while to them. And he begins to promote Rasputin, which then very much regretted, in particular saying that this is the voice of the Russian people, it is a simple man. And that for the royal family will be very, very important. Then he has more patrons, patronesses, or rather, two sisters who were hated at court. Two Montenegrin women who were called black crows. They're really two Montenegrin princesses, daughters of the ruler of Montenegro, Nikola Petrovich. Milica and Stana, Stana is Anastasia, who studied at the Smolny Institute, then stayed at court and then married two brothers, Grand Dukes, in particular to Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich, a very important man during the First World War, the uncle of the Tsar. And the Montenegrins, also inclined to mysticism, occult interests, they had already introduced various healers to the Tsar's family before. And in particular, in 1905, they contributed to the fact that in November 1905, at a difficult moment for the Tsar and the Tsarina, they meet a peasant man, Grigory, who makes a strong impression on them. And here, before we talk about what happened next, we need to understand what the royal family was at that moment. Well, as we know, Nicholas, while he was still the heir, fell in love with Alice of Hesse, of Hesse-Darmstadt. So then they would always say, especially during the war, that the Serena was German. There will be all these rumors that she has a direct telephone line to Berlin, and she gives all the military secrets to Kaiser Wilhelm. Well, she was indeed German, but most of her childhood was spent at the court of her grandmother, Queen Victoria. And actually, she and Nicholas spoke and wrote to each other in English for most of her life. So it was more like she could be called English, I guess. So marrying Nicholas, who'd just become Tsar, after the rather premature death of his father, Alexander III. She, of course, she converted to Orthodoxy, became Alexandra Fyodorovna, and was a deep hysterical Orthodox believer. And, of course, she considered herself an absolutely Russian person, no matter what anyone said about her. Well, and also, as has been written and said many times, that, on the one hand, Nicholas and Alexandra were very much attached to each other, very much in love with each other, were devoted to each other. And their narrow family life, especially before the tragedy with Tsarevich Alexei, was a happy life. They loved each other, they loved their children, they had a wonderful relationship. Of course, their life was greatly overshadowed by the fact that the Tsarina could not give birth to an heir, a boy, but gave birth to four daughters. And finally, in 1904, Alexei came along, and it's discovered that he has hemophilia, a disease passed on from his mother. And it's going to be a terrible tragedy, basically, and a terrible sense of guilt for the Empress for passing on this incredible disease to her son. And it's something that will probably shape a lot of their lives. That Alexandra was unable to give birth to a boy for a long time, and then the boy was born sick. And of course, that's a big contributor to the fact that they were surrounded by some healers all the time. Some traveling preachers, some sandals, Mitya Kozelski. A.K.A. Mitya Gugnivi or Mitya Kolyaba. And all this on the one hand somehow resonated in such occult aspirations of the Empress. First of all, of course, the Empress, Nicholas, was more cautious who hoped to find support and help in her problems here. 
And on the other hand, for them, these were people from the people. They didn't see the people anywhere in general. Nikolai and Alexandra lived a very sheltered life. As it became clear that the Tsarevich was ill, they became more and more distant even from the court. Already after 1905, they lived more and more in Tsarskoye Selo, practically did not appear in St. Petersburg. Just when Rasputin will appear with them, it will be another moment that alienated them from many. They sat at their place in Tsarsko Selo with a narrow circle of people close to them. Like, again, the infamous and very much demonized Anna Vyrubova. Unhappy, ill and injured in a railroad accident. Such an enthusiastic woman who was simply a friend of the Tsarina. They hardly ever went outside their own narrow circle. What to speak of the Russian people? And for them, of course, it was very important. Let's not forget that Nicholas was brought up in the ideas of, well, roughly speaking, orthodoxy, autocracy, nationality, that famous Uvarov triad. He believes that these are the three most important principles for all Russian life. He will be brought up by Konstantin Petrovich Pobedonostsev, just like his father before him. Who will instill in him thoughts of the sacred character of autocracy? the nationality of the autocracy, which rests on the true popular faith in the Tsar. And then there are all these strange people, like this very Mitya Kozelsky, who was obviously an invalid from childhood. He had some very severe musculoskeletal problems. He could hardly speak. He made some strange noises. He had an interpreter with him, a very cunning man who explained what Mitya wanted to say. From all appearances, he probably hadn't been living at Optina Desert since he was a child, but from some point in time. He was not a monk, but he was warmed here, considered a fool. Further, as it was told that allegedly in 1900 from a stroke of thunder, he suddenly was able to walk and talk, and in his hand he had a cross. Then there was talk of him healing with the cross. And then he began to prophesy. And this interpreter of his explained all these prophecies. And then he appeared in St. Petersburg. And he was received by St. John of Kronstadt. And he was received by the same Bishop Theophan. And finally he is received by the royal family. And he shouted something incomprehensible there. And this interpreter, with the wonderful name of Elpidifor Kananikin, he first said that Mitya wanted to see the Tsar's children. And then he mumbled something else and said he wanted tea. And a very interesting thing is that the Tsar talked to him for a long time. A remarkable historian, Sergei Vladimirovich Mironenko, in his lecture on Rasputin, he says this marvelous thing. He quotes an entry in Nicholas's diary from 1906. At four o'clock to us came a man of God, Dmitri, from Kozelsk, near Optina Pustini. He brought an image painted according to a vision he had recently had. We talked with him for about an hour and a half. And further, Mironenko comments admirably, one is left wondering what they could have talked about for so long. But an hour and a half conversation with an almost mute man who was proclaimed a visionary illustrates the atmosphere in the imperial family. And the intersection of these factors, on the one hand, the Empress's mad desire to have an heir, and then, naturally, the desire to cure her son of an incurable disease. And on the other hand, the desire to communicate with the real people, like there are these real people somewhere, it gave rise to people like Dmitry Kozelsky at court an equally exotic figure who was no longer quite a people's figure, was, so to speak, Dr. Philippe, who wasn't really a doctor at all, but a French healer who lived a very remarkable life, very characteristic of such people. Very characteristic that I was preparing for a lecture. I looked up this Wikipedia article about this Nisier Antelm Philippe, and it's very, shall we say, serious. How he experienced the revelation, how he experienced the gift of healing, 
how he worked in Leon for his relative as a butcher and cut the tendons in his arm. And he healed them himself in an incredible way. That's it, that's it, that's how it was. Then he started healing everybody left and right. And his enemies wouldn't let him do it because he didn't have a medical degree. And then he was in church where the priest said that biblical miracles should not be taken literally. And he went up to the priest after the service and started arguing with him. And the priest said, lightning will strike the church sooner than I believe it. And naturally, at that very moment, the lightning struck and then he believed it all. Monsieur Philippe finds himself at court and he has great influence with the empress. And when they start talking about how he's somehow curing the empress in some obscure way, and he doesn't even have a diploma, and Nicholas writes to the French government that it would be impossible to give a diploma to this Philip, who is so beneficial to his wife and to him. The French refuse. Then he asks Russia to give him a diploma. And supposedly they give him some kind of exam where he goes to the hospital, looks at the people and says they're all cured. Oh, like they've really recovered some kind of diploma. Anyway, it's all terribly upsetting to the courtiers and the scientists. And the Tsar's mother, Maria Feodorovna, who watches it all with horror, and they are being pressured in every possible way to kick out this crook. But they don't kick him out, they let him go. With incredible gifts, with these letters of commendation, he tells the queen that she's going to have a son soon, but that she should never allow doctors to see her. And in 1901, of course, a completely horrifying and tragic story takes place. I don't know if you can call it a disease. The Tsarina announces that she's pregnant. She starts to get fat. She's waiting for the birth. Of course, she's sure she's having a boy. Because that's what Philip predicted, that she would have a boy. She moves from Sarskoye Selo to St. Petersburg. She's already preparing for the birth. She doesn't let the doctors in like he told her to. And just as the whole country is waiting for the heir to arrive, the doctors finally examine her and it turns out she's not pregnant. I mean, how much persuasion must this man have to make her believe in him like that? And the memory of him was very strong in both Nicholas and Alexandra. They, Alexandra believed that he was in heaven helping them and all that sort of thing. Uh, and against this background, in November 1905, they have Rasputin. And you have to realize that November 1905 is, by all accounts, on all sides, the hardest time for them. They have a long-awaited son, and he has this severe, painful disease. And hemophilia, it's not just there, the blood doesn't clot in long bleedings. It's excruciating, it's painful. A boy grows up, he will naturally run, fall, bump. And the bleeding could go on for days until a clot formed to stop it. It was all very painful. He has to lie in bed for months. It's clear he can't live much longer. It's all terrible for the queen. On the other hand, it's 1905. It's revolution, it's turmoil. Here it is, their people who are supposed to love the Tsar so much. What's happening? There's already been bloody Sunday when the troops shot at the people. There's already been a revolt on the battleship Potemkin. There's already a lot going on. And it is also clear that all this is not easy for the Tsar. His conscience torments him, of course. And on the other hand, he was already forced to give the manifesto of October 17 and promise to convene the legislative Duma. This is also a tragedy for Nicholas. He keeps saying, he keeps repeating, that he can't squander the inheritance he got from his ancestors. That is, he received unlimited autocratic power. And for him, it's not tyranny, it's his sacred power. And what is it? Is he going to pass on the squandered inheritance to his son? Will he hand over the power with some stupid Duma, with some parliament? He is forced to do it, although he couldn't make up his mind until the last moment. He wanted to introduce a dictatorship, but he realized it would be seas of blood. That's when a man from the people appears who, by the way, will always convince him that it is not necessary to limit the autocracy, that it is necessary to hold on to a firm power. 
but it is necessary to take care of the men, it is necessary to turn to the righteous. And for them, Rasputin, the main righteous man, plus the question of what Rasputin did with Tsarevich Alexei, this is a very difficult question. Because it is believed that he hypnotized him and thus calmed him down and stopped the blood. There are those who believe that he had no hypnotic effect, that all this is gossip. But if you look at the portraits of Rasputin, of course, some magnetism comes from him. But that doesn't tell us anything. It's possible, of course, that he was just calming. With his stories and his prayers, he calmed both the Tsar and the Tsarina, and this influenced both the boy and his daughters. And there are stories of the most contradictory that how beautiful children prayed with Rasputin, listened to his stories. And this is just such a fabulous hagiography. And there are stories that are just the opposite. What is this? He comes into the girl's bedroom when they're already in their nightgowns. Their teacher was outraged. How is that possible? And then it is already some completely different, vile and dirty story. But for the Tsarina above all, and for the Tsar too, all the stories about Rasputin's escapades, they... The Tsarina did not believe simply, the Tsar may have believed. He was shown police reports, how he there visited a brothel, came out, urinated on the wall of the church, how he danced with gypsy girls in the pit and then took off his pants and showed all his privates. The Tsar knew all this, but first of all, he considered it an outrageous interference in his family life. This is who is, who we have brought closer to us. This is our business. Secondly, the famous phrase that it is better ten Rasputin than one hysteria of the Empress. He, of course, did not want to go against his wife. And for her, he really was a holy man. He was a healer. That said, here again about Rasputin's healing, about his holy qualities, there are as many stories about his orgies as there are about his orgies. But they are, in fact, as little substantiated as the stories about the orgies. Or at least, let's just say, just as badly inflated. Here are a few examples of recollections of miracles performed by Rasputin. Something strange happened. It recalls a woman who had a dying niece in Kiev. He took my hand. His face changed, became like a dead man, yellow, waxy, and immobile to the horror. His eyes had rolled back completely, and only the whites were visible. He pulled me sharply by the arms and said deftly, She will not die. She will not die. She will not die. Then he let go of my hands, his face regained its former colouring and continued the conversation as if nothing had happened. I was about to leave for Kiev in the evening, but I received a telegram. Alesa is better, the temperature has fallen. When asked to do more like this, Rasputin replied, That was not from me, but from above, and again it cannot be done. But in fact, there is no evidence here that Rasputin cured her niece. He convinced her that the girl would not die. At which point there was a crisis in another town and her niece was cured. No evidence that it was really from the fact that he had there rolled his eyes, that he said she wouldn't die, that that's what cured her. No evidence. Another story of a man whose son suffered from a disease that was considered incurable. His right arm was constantly shaking and his whole right side was paralyzed. I brought my son to Rasputin's apartment, put him in a chair in the dining room, knocked on the bedroom door myself and quickly left his apartment. My son came home an hour later. He told me that Rasputin came out of his room, sat down opposite him in the armchair, put his hands on his shoulders and directed his gaze firmly to his eyes and shook violently. The trembling gradually abated, Rasputin calmed down. Then he jumped up and shouted at him, Go, boy, go home, or I'll flog you. The boy jumped up, laughed, and ran home. We have heard many such stories about ancient, medieval, and modern healers. About water charged by Alan Chumak, about Kasparovsky's sessions, and so on. And here, it could just be all made up. It could be a father's overblown sense of how sick his son really was. 
and it can, if it's some kind of nervous disease, it can for a while, of course, there can't be a complete cure. But when a strong, powerful, with a magnetizing gaze, a man says to him, get up, it can certainly work for a while. An even more remarkable story. The famous deputy of the State Duma, the nationalist Shulgin, recalls, Rasputin in Kiev out of the blue gave money to a drunken woman. She is poor, poor. She does not know. She now has a child died. She'll come home and find out, he explained to his surprised companion. To Shulgin's question about the child, the latter replied, Dead, I was checking on purpose, I asked her address. Well, that is clairvoyance Rasputin in this case confirmed. The words of Rasputin himself. He gave Bala money, and then he informed Shulgin that he checked, and the child really died. There is no other evidence. Another thing, Rasputin, indeed people helped people. In those years when he was in power, he had people crowding into his apartment. He took money from some people. Some people asked him to help them get promoted and appointments and so on and so forth. There were people whom he sincerely helped. By the way, they were mostly poor, unhappy, with sick children, some poor official's widow or a peasant woman. He could give them money. He could help them fulfill their requests. In this too, he could not be refused which does not contradict the fact that when they brought him money and gave him bribes, of course he took them, that he naturally used his influence to pursue some of his policies. But here we come to another interesting thing. Because the conversations are not just volumes about Rasputin's debauchery. All these rumors about his affair with the Tsarina, of course, did not exist. That's one side of the case which is spreading. He himself, of course, seems to like to boast of his influence on the Tsarina's family and inflated it very much. And from here came, came, came further various rumors, caricatures. Some letters appeared, some of them real or not. Somehow got into the hands of various unscrupulous people. Another accusation very strongly put forward, say, by members of the State Duma, that Rasputin influences politics. And a lot of books have been written about this too, and stories and memoirs, as here he writes a note, Daddy, accept this little man, do something for him. And Daddy, I mean Nikolai, immediately does it. It doesn't seem to be that simple. There was an emigrant historian, Sergei Oldenburg, who did some interesting research. He studied the Tsarina's letters to Nicholas and at least the advice she gave Rasputin. And she writes to him incessantly, Our friend, as she called Rasputin, our friend tells you, be stricter. When even during the war, our friend and about the war and about appointments spoke out about everything. Oldenburg analyzed the advice that the Tsarina gave to Nicholas. And then he started to look, did Nicholas follow this advice? And it turns out that he almost never followed them. That is, in some small things, of course, he could appoint someone somewhere. He could accept a person who was asked to accept Rasputin. But it seems that in some matters of principle, Nicholas was the kind of man, of course, soft and pliable, but on the other hand, stubborn. That is, he listened to his wife. Yes, 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 of course, but he did not always follow it. But of course, the rise of Rasputin, which occurred after 1905, it wasn't such a straight line upwards. At some point, he was advised to leave. He left. He made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Then he went to his village. Then there was, of course, a very important moment for the Tsarina, when Alexei once again fell ill, and it seemed that he was certainly dying. And the unhappy boy said to his parents, when I die, put a small monument to me in the yard. How does it feel for the mother to hear this? And Rasputin was at that time in the village, and he was sent a letter asking for help. He sent a telegram. Well, that's about the same as with the niece of the woman I quoted. He sent a telegram that the boy wouldn't die. And the boy didn't die. 
and Alexandra was sure that she should be grateful to Rasputin, and his influence is growing more and more, and it irritates all sorts of forces. There is a very strange, incomprehensible, and dirty story about a fight that took place in 1911 between Bishop Hermogenes, a terrifying man too, such a nightmare black hundred sotnik, who demanded that Merezhkovsky be excommunicated, that Vasily Rozumov be excommunicated. In general, any step to the side was heresy for him. He forbade the funeral service for the famous actress Vera Komisarzhevskaya. Well, he was a reactionary of reactionaries. And so it seems that Hermogenes Iliodorus, which we've already talked about, was somehow hoping to manipulate Rasputin. And for a while he was close to them. And then in general it became clear that he does not let himself be manipulated. In 1911 this strange story happened, which has very different accounts. It was described in detail by Iliodorus himself, but the question is how much we can believe him how they invited Rasputin to visit them. And Hermogenes, Iliodorus, the clergy, plus Mitya Kozelsky were there and they attacked Rasputin. And if you believe Iliodorus, Mitya there, he long shouted accusations, although how could he shout them when he could not practically say anything? And then there are different versions that Rasputin trembled, fell to his knees, that they made him kiss the cross, promised that he wouldn't go to the royal family again, that they tried to castrate him. So nothing is clear, some strange dirty rumors, but it is clear that there was just some kind of a fight, such a strange clash. Then, especially from 1912 onwards, there's an increasingly strong and colorful campaign of the State Duma deputies, started by Alexander Guchkov, a bright, strong, interesting man. We have already talked about him when there was a lecture about the February Revolution. Guchkov made a speech exposing Rasputin, and there will be many such speeches. Chairman of the Duma, Rodzianko, will try to talk to the Tsar and get Rasputin removed. Maria Fyodorovna, the Tsar's mother, of course, there was her bad relationship with her daughter-in-law, but in the end, when she realized that she could not influence her son and remove Rasputin, she went to Kiev and almost never returned to St. Petersburg. That is, many tried to put pressure on the Tsar. And it was here that the idea that Rasputin influenced politics. In 1912 began a lot of publications in the press. Starting with the Yellow Press, with all sorts of horror stories about Rasputin and just denouncing the fact that he could influence politics. At the same time, Nicholas demanded that they stop these publications. He was told that we actually have censorship since 1905. Prior censorship has been abolished. We cannot prohibit. They started calling the editors of the largest newspapers, telling them not to do that. Everything stopped for a while, then they started publishing again. So the closer we get to the revolution, the more tense relations become, and the darker this image of Rasputin. In 1914, Rasputin was in his homeland, in his village. He, by the way, very much opposed to Russia's entry into the war. But this is so, in between, another example of the fact that he was far from a fool. And in 1914, there was a strange, crazy mantis woman named Kionia Guseva, who, on the one hand, said she was incredibly religious, pure, beautiful, but at the same time, her nose was caved in by syphilis. But there it was explained that she supposedly prayed to God to deprive her of her beauty so she wouldn't attract men, and so God gave it to her. It's a bit of a strange story. Anyway, Kionia lunged at him and stabbed him. But, of course, he coped with her. He also cracked her with a stick, with an ogle. She was captured, she was treated. It's clear that she was a mad woman, but it's clear that it's madness, they said, by the way, that maybe Iliodorus was behind the assassination attempt, but even that is not necessary. It is clear that in this general atmosphere, when Rasputin is perceived as a demon simply, a mad woman like this couldn't help but appear. Then there will be some more of some strange attempts to attack Rasputin. 
Well, in particular, the Minister of the Interior, Kvostov, who was actually sort of Rasputin's protege and then decided he didn't need a patron. And he sort of tried to kill Rasputin too, to make an assassination attempt, but somehow so idiotic all this was organized that nothing happened. Where there is truth, where not. Also very unclear, very dark all this. But it is clear that some dirty intrigues were going on. And finally, at the end of 1916, two aristocrats, Felix Yusupov and his friend and apparent lover, both of them bisexual, of course, his lover, the Grand Duke Dmitry Pavlovich, start thinking about how to get rid of Rasputin. And then, of course, also amazing things that show and the situation in general at that time and the attitude towards Rasputin and the level of the elite of the time. A famous lawyer, cadet, a member of the Duma Vasily Maklakov, later in exile in his memoirs, does not hesitate to write the following. How Yusupov came to him in the fall of 1916 and said, Help me find a man who would kill Rasputin. Well, for Yusupov, it is clear that the cadet, that some terrorist, sir, it's all about the same. Here he is a member of the Duma. He probably has, Maklakov says to him, do you think I have a murderer's office? But what's interesting is that Maklakov is a lawyer, a liberal. He's giving Yusupov advice. He says, and then you see, you'll hire a killer and it won't help anything. If you're going to kill, you have to do it in a completely different way. It is necessary that it is not known who killed. It is necessary that some mystical blow was struck on this elder. And Yusupov, if we believe the memoirs of Maklakov, he comes to him several times, consults, and he gives him advice on how best to kill. But of course, this is a completely absurd Kafkaesque situation. And then a small company is formed. Yusupov, Dmitry Pavlovich, Dr. Stanislav Lazovert, who is sort of believed to have given them the poison. Apparently, it was assumed that maybe he owed some. If a corpse was, say, found, they wanted, on Maklakov's advice, to make the corpse disappear, that maybe he would write some documents. But the main thing, of course, is that he gave poison. And Lieutenant Sergei Sukotin, plus another one, incredible, scandalous, ready for anything talented and slippery type, the Black Hundred's deputy Purishkevich. Two aristocrats, a doctor, a military man, and a deputy. They decide to kill Rasputin. But there's another complication. Because we know what happened mainly from two memoirs. From the memoirs of Yusupov, Yusupov later, in exile, of course, very much peddled this image of himself as Rasputin's killer and wrote memoirs and talked about it. As far as it corresponded to reality, it is not quite clear. Well, that is that he killed, yes, but the specific details, there may be discrepancies. And Purishkevich's memoirs, which it is not at all clear how much we can believe, the others in general have already written nothing. But Yusupov described very interestingly, beautifully and impressively how he communicated with Rasputin, what a strong impression he made on him, how he then realized that it was necessary to get rid of him, how he began to invite him to visit him, promising to introduce him to his wife. And the wife was a royal relative. Irina was very good looking, but in general at that moment she was not in St. Petersburg. She was in the Crimea. So he invites him, promises to introduce him, but he says to no one so that no one knows because her parents don't want her to meet you. Hence the mystery that surrounds this invitation to visit. How he arrives at Rasputin's house and even sees him in a family setting with his daughters. And he has some qualms of conscience. But he thinks, we must. And still he takes him with him. There's a table set up in the basement of his house. Upstairs, he says, the guests are here. So when the guests leave, Irina will come down here. And that's where the rest of the conspirators are actually sitting. And so he brings him, while Rasputin says to him, You know, Protopopov, Minister Protopopov, who was close to Rasputin, he says to me, Watch out, you'll be killed. That is, there were some rumors. 
then also begins a fairy tale which has been repeatedly reproduced on how Rasputin did not die, how the poison on him did not work, as shots even, it would seem to have to kill him, but he then jumped up again. Hence the legend that he even allegedly breathed in the ice hole where they dumped his body, that his lungs were full of water. All these stories should also show some kind of mystical, incredible power of Rasputin, that they are not a man ordinary kill, they kill some devil creature. How was it really? What was there with this poison? Maybe the hydrocyanic acid reacted chemically with the wine and weakened. Maybe the Lazavert got scared and gave something else instead of the poison. It's not clear at all, just as it is not clear who really shot them and how things really were. Grand Duke Dmitry Pavlovich supposedly swore on the icon to his father that it was not he who killed. But he may have been lying, or he may not have been, or maybe he did. Maybe Yusupov? It's not clear. What is clear is that they did kill Rasputin. To hide it, to make it such a mystical disappearance, they could not. Because first of all, there was a rumble, screams, cries, gunshots. As Perishkevich writes that a town policeman came running and Perishkevich said to him, I am a deputy of the State Duma. Do you know who Rasputin is? I know. We've killed him now. And allegedly, the policeman said to him, Good deed, Baron, we have done. But the policeman immediately ran to the station and reported what had happened. And then they threw him into the ice hole, and one galosh is slipped off. They didn't notice it, and they found it later, so they quickly found the body in the ice hole. Well, and very quickly it became clear Rasputin's daughter said that he left with Prince Yusupov. Yusupov said that, yes, we left together, and then I don't know where he went. Well, all in all, it all came to light very quickly, naturally, and it was all sewn up with white threads, or bloody threads, rather. And then it also says a lot about the general atmosphere because they were being congratulated. And Zinaida Yusupova, Felix's mother, her friends also wrote to her, congratulating her, saying what a wonderful thing her son had done. Nikolai couldn't punish anyone. He sent Dmitry Pavlovich as a diplomat to Persia, and a whole deputation of Grand Dukes showed up and said that the climate there was very bad and he shouldn't be sent there. His relatives wrote letters to him that he should not touch Dmitry Pavlovich. Nicholas said reasonably enough that in fact no one should be killed, neither the Grand Duke nor a man. They demanded a trial. There arose such a complicated thing that people who were on the same case were to be tried by one court. And the Grand Duke could not be tried by an ordinary court, he could be tried only by the Emperor. Therefore, it was unclear who would judge them, but as a result, there was no trial. But Nicholas saved the lives of both Dmitry Pavlovich and Yusupov, who were expelled from St. Petersburg, and so they were able to then safely emigrate after the revolution. Fates are put together in a surprising way. Lieutenant Sukotin, who was also involved in the murder of Rasputin, although it's not entirely clear what his role was, Strange turns will occur in his life. He will be sentenced to execution after the revolution. Then it seems he will be replaced by imprisonment. Then he would be released and he would be the commandant of Yasnaya Polyana and married for a while to Tolstoy's granddaughter, the man who killed Rasputin. These are some twists and turns that can't be invented on purpose, as they call it. Then he became very ill and he was allowed to go abroad. And he was treated abroad, and Felix Yusupov took a great part in organizing the treatment. Such strange things happen in history. Further again, there are different, very different opinions that the murder of Rasputin is, well, it's sort of the first swallow before the revolution, already showing the general outrage that brought the revolution closer or vice versa, that this is an attempt to save the monarchy, it failed. Or that it was a completely separate story that couldn't change anything. A famous historian, Andrei Amalric, who wrote a biography of Rasputin such, in general, rather sympathetically written to Rasputin, he keeps going on and on about how Rasputin was so heavily demonized and so terrifying. Not because he was so terrible, 
it's because there were other people who drank just as much, who drank just as much, maybe even more, but that he was repulsive, like a man who had risen too high. That this irritated the courtiers, of course, and the deputies. That is, not that he gives incomprehensible advice, and not that he is so vicious, but that he ends up where he shouldn't be. Amalric writes, the point was not in Rasputin's amoralism, but in his democratism. The Tsar and the man stretched out their hands to each other over the heads of privileged society. That's the scarecrow. Well, this is, of course, such a bold statement. But on the other hand, there is something to it. That is what was not forgiven Rasputin would forgive, well, let's say some Felix Yusupov, maybe so. And on the other hand, here is a movie by Elim Klimov Agony. A movie, of course, with a tragic fate which was banned. The authors were literally forced to change the concept, to change the script, to remake it. Then in the end, the movie was put on the shelf. Well, the result was such a strange movie. But of course, with the absolutely brilliant Alexei Petrenko playing Rasputin. But I probably won't say anything fundamentally new if I say that Petrenko was an actor of such incredible, fantastic power. It was enough for him, I don't know, to raise his hand. And it already seemed like some, I don't know, tectonic shifts were taking place. And there's this amazing scene in the movie when Rasputin practically appears for the first time. The first time, I don't know, somewhere not in close-up. Nicholas enters the room where Rasputin is lulling, soothing the air. There you can see that he sits, sings something to him, says something. And then he takes the air away, and there is some crowd, the entourage after him leaves. So he is shown in the general mess, and then he starts to act. There's a scene of a party, quite farcical, but as I understand it, the idea was to show the real Rasputin. On the one hand, the real Rasputin, and on the other hand, a little made up. And there, so there are saigons, a saigon dances, very funny, all this is depicted. And Rasputin is lying among all this food, gypsies, music. And then suddenly he starts to get up to go dancing with this gypsy woman. And it's filmed in such a way that it's as if he grows up out of all these people around him. And here rises this grandiose Petrenko. And it's like a giant stands up. And then there's this crazy dance. I think it's largely because of the charm that Rasputin had, maybe a negative charm, so to speak. Which is, of course, a lot of the reason why the movie was shelved when it was made. But I don't want to justify Rasputin and say how wonderful and beautiful he was. And of course, the very fact that he appeared speaks to this mysticism. This sort of feverish attempt by the royal family, by the royal entourage, to find some sort of foothold in a world that was collapsing around them. And say the title of Klimov's movie, Agony, probably also speaks volumes. But on the other hand, there was a power in Rasputin that you can't help but recognize. And I'm sure that there will be further studies as the passions, hopefully, the passions around the 17th year and the royal family in general will somehow cool down and there will be an opportunity for objective research of this incredibly interesting person, this incredibly interesting phenomenon. Thank you all. Thanks to whom this record was made possible. Thank you to our patrons on Patreon and our sponsors on YouTube. We couldn't have done it without you. And if anyone else wants to support us, you know the link is at the bottom. And of course, it's interesting to know what you think of Rasputin. What do you think? Holy devil? Or a holy old man? Or a pawn in the hands of dark forces? Or just an interesting and extraordinary man? We look forward to your comments. Have a nice day.